Welcome to a very special edition of Jane's World of Intelligence podcast. It's hosted today by the Jane's Terrorism and Insurgency Centre team, led by myself, Matthew Henman, and I'm joined by JTIC colleagues, Olivia. Hello, Olivia here, an analyst at JTIC. And on the phone, Gabriella. Hi, I'm also an analyst. So JTIC is the bespoke terrorism and insurgency team at Jane's, focusing on all issues, global, domestic and local, anything from the Islamic State down to the local activities of animal rights extremists. For more information on JTIC and what we do, you can look at the Jane's Global Attack Index infographic on janes.com forward slash terrorism, which will give you a great introduction to the team, what we do, and the kind of output that we have. What we're looking to do with the show today is talk a little bit about current trends, developments in global terrorism and insurgency, provide some analysis and the forecast. We've got a great interview with Antonio Giustosi about the conflict in Afghanistan and the prospects therein. We're then going to have a cultural discussion at the end where we're going to talk a little bit about one of our favourite team films, Four Lions. So beginning the trend and analysis part of the podcast, we're going to start off in Niger. Obviously, over the past few weeks, there's been high levels of violence, not just in Niger, but across the wider part of the Sahel. And last week, there was a massive assault on a military camp in western Niger, close to the Mali border. Militants used mortars and suicide car bombs to target a key military base before a substantial motorised assault on the facility, which led to the base being overrun and captured. More than 70 soldiers were killed, dozens of others were left missing. The militants also looted large amounts of arms and supplies from the military base as well. So did any group claim this attack, Matt? Yeah, so this attack was claimed by the Islamic State. Interestingly, even though the attack was conducted in the Sahel, it was claimed by the Islamic State's West Africa province, which speaks to the broader consolidation of violence in West Africa and the Sahel under this particular affiliate. And have they um, conducted any attacks like this before in the region? Yeah, there's a long-running history of high-profile attacks by this group, not just in, across West Africa, but in the Sahel as well. So just last month, more than 75 soldiers in Mali were killed in just two Islamic State attacks. And then earlier in August, the group killed at least 24 soldiers um, in an assault on a base in northern Burkina Faso. Um, and how does this link to the wider militancy in the Sahel? Is Al-Qaeda still active in the area? Yeah, absolutely. Al-Qaeda is still very much active in the Sahel. While it's the Islamic State that is claiming all the high-profile attacks and earning the headlines, Al-Qaeda and its local forces operating under the JNIM alliance in the Sahel are still very much active, still pose a, uh, a significant threat to security forces across the region. You know, most notably, at the end of September, they killed at least 38 Malian soldiers in an attack. Uh, there was also an attack at the beginning of November in Burkina Faso, uh, where a Canadian mining company's convoy was ambushed and at least 37 people killed. So looking ahead to the coming 12 months in the Sahel, the prospects are pretty bleak, to be honest. The local security forces have little in the way of capabilities to prevent militants from moving across borders, from utilising safe areas and staging grounds in the region. Are British troops being sent to Mali next year? Uh, yeah, that's right. So it was announced earlier this summer that uh, a small force of 250 British soldiers are going to be deployed to northern Mali as part of the MINUSMA uh, peacekeeping mission there. It's going to be interesting to see the capabilities that they bring and the impact they're able to have on a local level. The corollary to that is unfortunately going to be that they are going to provide a, uh, a very attractive target to jihadists in the region, both Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, so it could lead to an intensification of fighting. One of the other issues that we've been looking at a lot over the past few weeks and months is the issue of anti-Semitic violence in the US. Now, Gabby, I saw over the past few days there's been another anti-Semitic attack, a deadly anti-Semitic attack in the US. Could you tell us a little bit more? Yeah, Matt. So there was a small arms attack on the 10th of December targeting a kosher supermarket in New Jersey City in New Jersey where three people were killed. So shortly after the attack began, police officers killed the two suspects during a shootout. Their social media records indicate that they were black Hebrew Israeli followers. That's interesting. I mean, that's not a, a movement or a name that you come up all that often. Could you tell us a little bit about those for, for listeners and certainly for myself who maybe aren't as familiar uh, with that movement? Yeah, absolutely. So they're, um, they're a movement of African-American Jews, known mainly for their nonviolent, although controversial preachings. Um, they essentially believe that the 12 tribes of Israel 
as described in the Old Testament, are different ethnic groups and that whites are not included. So they see modern Jews as imposters of the faith, which is a potential indicator for the motivations behind the attack. And now the depth of any of the involvement of the perpetrators with the movement is unknown. And even the leader of the Black Hebrew Israeli organization explicitly denounced the violence. So, Gabby, how does this fit into the wider issue of anti-Semitic violence in the United States? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really important question. It definitely follows a series of deadly anti-Semitic attacks in the past months. The FBI found that assaults targeting Jews were at record high numbers in 2018. And JTIC data shows that these attacks are mainly motivated by individuals with right-wing extremist ideologies, including the October 2018 Free of Life Synagogue shooting, which killed 11 people. While arson and vandalism directly targeting synagogues are the predominant form of anti-Semitic violence in the U.S., JTIC has recorded three anti-Semitic small arms attacks in the past 14 months, killing a total of 15 people. This demonstrates an intent by individuals to conduct deadlier attacks. Obviously, the issue of anti-Semitic violence is already at at a national level in the US. But um, obviously, looking ahead to the coming 12 months, we've got elections coming up in the US. How do you think that kind of situation is going to uh, affect the threat of anti-Semitic violence? So looking forward at the 2020 election, um, a Trump re-election bid is likely to escalate the plotting of conducting hate crimes, many of those targeting the Jewish community. So we're definitely likely to see this trend continuing. But I think what's important to note is that this attack also highlighted the, the lower but present threat posed by individuals influenced by extremist interpretations of the Black Hebrew Israeli ideology. Now, while the incidence of such violence is likely to remain low over the coming six to 12 months. The progression from attacking property to attacking individuals signals a potential escalation of the threat posed. And it's definitely something that we will be monitoring in the next coming months. Great. Thank you so much, Gabby. So in terms of trend analysis, forecasts for the year ahead, one of the things that I'd want to flag is the global attack index that uh, JTIC produces on an annual basis, looking at data from the preceding year and using that to make forecasts for violence over the year ahead. The 2018 infographic that we produced for the annual attack index is available, as I said earlier, at janes.com forward slash terrorism. And the 2019 version will be available at that site around mid to late January. But in terms of where we kind of currently stand in 2019, uh, Olivia, I know that you spent a lot of your time working with the data. How are the figures looking currently? So if we look at attacks and fatalities um, that JTIC has recorded. So in 2018, um, JTIC recorded nearly 34,000 attacks. And in comparison to 2019, to the end of November, JTIC recorded over 28,000. So that shows a downturn in attacks of nearly 17%. And then when we look at fatalities, JTIC recorded just over 36,000 fatalities in 2018. And if we look at 2019, from figures recorded um, until the end of November, it was nearly 36,000. So seeing as um, our figures have been taken from the end of November, so we've got a full month to come um, and it is quite possible that the 2019 fatalities could surpass 2018 figures, especially if we see some mass casualties over the holiday period. So in our full infographic that we will release in January, you'll be able to see a broader and complete analysis of 2019. So we will provide analysis of the geographic distribution of attacks um, and also operational trends, um, including principal tactics, targets and the groups involved in these attacks. So in terms of forecasts and looking ahead, it's going to be another big year for Afghanistan as it always tends to be. We're very fortunate joining us for an interview on Afghanistan, the Taliban and the Islamic State is Antonio Giustosi. I'm sure he'll be well known by many of our listeners, but if if you're not familiar with Antonio, he's uh, a leading academic researcher and analyst on Afghanistan. Um, He published a very influential Quran, Kalashnikov and Laptop in 2007, and since then has published a series of fantastic articles and books covering the conflict in Afghanistan. So he produced an excellent book called The Islamic State in Khorasan in 2018, focusing on the Islamic State's activities in Afghanistan, and earlier this year released The Taliban at War, which provides a incredible overview of the group's uh, campaign and its insurgency since 2001. 
Recently, Antonio wrote for us a piece covering the, the ongoing conflict between the Taliban and its non-state rival in Afghanistan, uh, Wilayat Khorasan, and the victory that the Taliban has essentially achieved over the Islamic State after the several years of fighting. So we'll jump right into that, Antonio. Could you kind of explain a little bit of the, of the background to the conflict and essentially what has occurred in this latest round of fighting? Well, essentially, uh, Wilayat Khorasan has been fighting mainly since its inception in 2015 against the Taliban. They did some perfunctory fighting against the Afghan government, against the Americans, but I would say 90% of their military effort was against the Taliban. And they managed over time to establish themselves in much of Nanga province and control between 15 and 25% of it, depending on the period. So a substantial part of Nanga was under their control. Most of the areas that used to be under Taliban control. So for the Taliban was a was a challenge, a direct challenge also to their monopoly over the insurgency. And they had to do something about it. Why they waited so long to mount a decisive offensive against Velayel Khorasan? I think there are a number of factors here. But the fact that this year they've been reluctant to commit the full strength of the mobile force against the uh, the Afghan government, mainly because they are negotiating with the Americans over a peace deal. That meant that they had substantial forces that were quite fresh, still at the end of the fighting season. And because it was the end of the fighting season, they could be redeployed and concentrated in Nangara to achieve at least temporary superiority over uh, the Islamic State. So that, I think, is what happened. You know, the Taliban were able in winning for the first time, to challenge the Islamic State with uh, elite units. They were usually deployed elsewhere uh, in numbers that were never you know, were unprecedented in the region. That is essentially, I think, the main factor. And then the other thing is that they caught the, you know, with Ayat Khorasan in, in, in a difficult moment. Uh, Baghdadi died not long before uh, the offensive actually started. That, of course, had an impact on morale. It also was disruptive because many of the, you know, essentially the leadership of the Khorasan, they are all personally close to al-Baghdadi. They were chosen by him and they had direct links to him. The moment he was killed, uh, there was some disrupting the chain of command. They made it difficult for uh, Wilayat Khorasan to operate quickly and effectively as he used to do in the past. So morale was low. The chain of command was disrupted. And also, it seems that uh, William Corsan was suffering for some funding issues over the last few months. I think it was okay. affected negatively by the establishment of Vilaya Pakistan, a new province that eats into the area of uh, uh, operations of uh, Vilaya Corsan. Apparently, the funding for Vilaya Corsan was taken out of the pot where Vilaya Corsan was being funded. And... Uh, the other factor is quite a few Pakistani members of Iraq Khorasan opted to join Wilayat Pakistan, therefore weakening it numerically. And these were seasoned fighters that have been around for quite a quite a long time. So having suffered yeah, the territorial losses, uh, having suffered yeah, this internal turmoil, what in your opinion, I guess, is, is, is the future for, for Wilayat Khorasan? Are they going to try and challenge the Taliban in Nangahar or, or essentially are they finished? for the time being in eastern Afghanistan? Are they going to have to refocus their efforts elsewhere in the country? Well, apart from the territorial losses, Wilayat Khorasan suffered very serious personnel losses. Not so much in terms of people killed. There probably were under 200 those killed. But there are quite a few defections, especially quite a large number of Pakistanis still in the ranks of Wilayat Khorasan, who were in Afghanistan with their families, so wives and children. Unable to escape, he decided to surrender to the Afghan authorities to escape the Taliban. You know, probably they thought that surrendering to the Afghan government would, would have been better for them than surrendering to the Taliban. The Afghan government offered them essentially freedom. So they would surrender their weapons and they would be allowed to go home. So it was considered quite an attractive opportunity. Others, they fled into Pakistan and apparently they are considered to be missing in action by Vilayat Khorasan. They're not reporting back to the chain of command. So it's not clear whether they are coming back or not. So overall, they might have lost up to a thousand men. 
you know, in this offensive, which is hold more than half of their strength in Nanga. And Nanga was the main concentration of forces they had in the East. So clearly in the East now they are in a very bad shape. It's not clear at the moment whether the Taliban intend to go further and, and clean up Kuna province as well, which is a, the other significant concentration of Vilayat Khorasan force in the East. But even as it stands now, I think it will take a long time before uh, Vilayat Khorasan can go back on the offensive in Nanga. And they don't seem to intend to do it. Um, they're talking about like relocating their headquarters uh, and, and concentrating their resources elsewhere. Turning to the Taliban itself, I mean, obviously they are, um, yeah, Willa Khorasan is not alone in having kind of uh, internal struggles, internal issues. The Taliban is, um, yeah, it's been well documented over the past couple of years to be less than uh, less than united in terms of its leadership. And I'm wondering whether this victory against the Islamic State will have done anything to to counteract those issues, to unify the group behind the yeah, the leadership of Haibatullah, uh, or whether there is still a serious issue of, uh, of infighting and lack of internal unity within the Taliban. Well, I wouldn't say they're completely unified now, but uh, the leadership of Batullah, I think, is, looks stronger now. This is the first decisive victory that Abatullah achieved since he became leader. And it's good for him, it's good for his leadership. It also seems that the very fact that the Taliban were able to carry out this offensive, the fact that there was substantial unity to the different factions in carrying it out, it seems now, in fact, I've just heard that even the Khanis seem to, uh, at the last minute, have decided to take part in the off- on the offensive. So, uh, there was a display of unity that certainly benefits him, but also seems to indicate that the offensive was blessed by the Pakistani authorities. And the participation of the Khanis seemed to suggest that the Pakistanis uh, were behind it. These are all good news for Abatullah. doesn't mean that, you know, the division of the Taliban are, are gone for good, but it seems to be at the junction where he's got a real chance to unify the Taliban and, and his leadership. Obviously, that would come at a very opportune time for the Taliban. You know, obviously, as as you already referenced, you know, they spent much of this year uh, in negotiation with the US, you know, ahead of a possible peace deal. So, looking ahead to the next to twenty twenty, in your opinion, how likely are the are the two to kind of progress towards a peace deal? Are we likely to see any agreement established between the US and the Taliban, let alone between the Taliban and the Afghan government? Well, of course, uh, at the beginning of September, after Trump. Uh, tweeted that the meeting with the Taliban was off. There was a lot of pessimism about the chances of any any peace agreement. This seems to have changed now. Uh, I think the Americans, and particularly their, their top negotiator, uh, the Michael that see a new opportunity uh, to to reach an agreement with the Taliban uh, for two reasons. One is uh, uh, the fact that the current stall in, in the, uh, in the county of the votes in Afghanistan, the inability again of the Afghan authorities to resolve this fourth electoral crisis, which is the third one in a row in the presidential elections. And now the issue is whether, whether we'll be able to convince, uh, the two main challengers in this election, President Ghani, the Afghan president, and uh, Abdullah, the former uh, CEO. The issue is whether they can convince them to take a step back and over to a process that would lead to the formation of a coalition government if the issue of having another government in place more acceptable to the Taliban, a different coalition, would perhaps even a different president, that would be certainly a major turning point because that was one of the main issues the Taliban were not willing to make concessions on. So I think there are, you know, it's not, it's not done, of course. There is a resistance in Kabul, especially outgoing President Ghani doesn't seem keen to agree to anything like that. But I think the uh, Khalidad, some of the regional powers, China, Pakistan, and uh, the Taliban seem to see uh, renewed opportunities there. Absolutely. I think, um, Gabby, you had a question for Antonio as well. Yes, um, I was wondering, you know, do you predict greater involvement in the country by any other external powers like Russia, Iran, China in the coming 12 months? Is that something that you that you think is um, likely or feasible? Well, of course, there's already a lot of involvement by all of these countries. Will they get more involved? Uh, that's 
I think I don't expect that in the short term. Uh, I think more or less, with the exception of Iran, all the other countries have uh, an interest in some kind of political settlement taking place there. And I think they will be careful not to disrupt the Khalida process that really takes off. Then, of course, there's always a possibility that Khalida might fail again, and then you don't have a peace process. Um, that uh, then might change the equation, and then the different regional powers will have to reconsider uh, whether they can take over and lead a peace process or whether, you know, we go back to the battlefield and, and see what happens there. And we shouldn't forget that, you know, the rumors are that, and it's more than rumors, that President Trump is about to announce another, a further withdrawal, a further reduction of his troops in Afghanistan, and that might lead also in not so distant future to complete withdrawal. So, of course, the different regional powers will have to we consider the strategic options, you know, uh, if that happens. I mean, and, and looking ahead for the Taliban itself, obviously much of what happens across 2020 in terms of its operational patterns will depend on the course that negotiations take. Obviously, we've recorded over the course of this year as they've been negotiating that, you know, as you kind of alluded to earlier, that they've you know, pulled their punches a little bit when it comes to fighting the Afghan government. You know, they've not mounted major attacks on, on, on urban centres or attempted to hold cities like that. What do you expect to see from the Taliban? in the upcoming fighting season? Well, of course, it all depends on whether the peace process takes off or not. If it doesn't, I think the Taliban probably are willing to wait until the beginning of spring. Usually they don't do much in winter anyway. And then probably they will have to try to send a strong message to Kabul. You know, I think in Kabul now there is a perception that because this fighting season was not too bad from the Afghan government point of view, there is a kind of perception that they are able to stabilize the situation somehow. So the Taliban will have to break that perception. They will have to show them and they try to do already this at the end of August, beginning of September, when they launch a synchronized, three synchronized attacks against three different cities in a matter of days. So they, they will have to try again to show that the Taliban are still there. They are stronger than ever and more sophisticated than ever in their tactics. So with respect again, uh, more synchronized attacks against cities, probably more violent than what happened this summer, and shake the renewed confidence in Kabul that they can handle the situation. Great. Thanks so much, Antonio. We'll wrap up the discussion there. I just wanted to say yeah, a massive thank you for, for joining us, for offering these insights, and to reiterate to all of our listeners that if you're not aware of Antonio or, or if you're uh, not an owner of all of his books, then to go out and, uh, and make sure you check those out, some of the very best writing that's available on the conflict in Afghanistan. Thank you again, Antonio. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. Bye-bye. So after a lot of serious discussion, I think what we wanted to do was end the podcast on a bit of a lighter note. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to do somewhat of a cultural discussion. And seeing it as a special edition of the podcast, we thought what we could do is cover what has become the Jatic film of choice, which of course, Four Lions. For those that don't know, Four Lions was uh, released in May 2010 uh, by director Chris Morris, who is famous for a lot of iconic uh, British comedy work. The film is based around four aspirant jihadists, uh, three British Pakistanis and one British convert, all seeking to conduct an explosives attack. I'm not going to give away the ending. I'm sure that many of our listeners will have already seen the film, but in case you haven't, please do watch it. But we wanted to highlight the incongruity of a film on a topic around suicide bombers and terrorism that is actually incredibly funny, but also accurate and poignant and serious. One of the important things I think the film picks up is that all of the individuals are fairly unsuccessful. They're either in dead-end jobs, they're not particularly thriving in their community, and they're all seeking to use terrorism and, and conducting this attack as their way of you know, making their life matter and being of consequence. I think one of the things that the film does really well as in addition is highlighting the role of the negative conceptions of of Muslims and Islam in, in the UK and in the West in general only helps to further perpetrate this narrative and this process of radicalization. There's the key bit where Hassan is at the uh, the university conference that's going and he says, you know, if you treat me like a bomber, why shouldn't I be a bomber? Leading to his bizarre bit of performance art, perhaps my favorite act of jihadist rap. <laughs> 
Yeah, I also found that um, it does accurately reflect the state of militant Islamism in the UK at the time, yeah. um, especially the need to travel abroad, to receive training, to obtain an emir. And it's kind of in stark contrast to the past five years where the threat has diffused between foreign fighters in Syria and Iraq and also self-radicalised lone actors in the UK. There's also yeah, one of the central elements of the film is how they communicate with each other and try and uh, maintain their covert status. As Omar explained, you know, when they're communicating with, uh, with the emir back in Pakistan using uh, email drop boxes, but also the, uh, the Charles messaging uh, website Puffin Party, which um, leads to some incredible dialogue throughout. And obviously that stands in, again, pretty stark contrast to the current use of encrypted communication apps by militant Islamists, apps like Telegram, etc., which I'll also use as a, a quick plug for JTX Militant Propaganda Analysis Service, where we cover and provide analysis on all forms of propaganda released by non-state armed groups worldwide in terms of tracking the not just the content, but the significance of that propaganda as well. The other thing that I think the movie covers really well is an ideological movement that has kind of become more prevalent in the years that followed. So the uh, Barry's uh, idea of bombing the mosque in order to uh, radicalise the Ummah and cause people around the world to rise up and fight for Islam, it's very reminiscent of the ideological position that Al-Qaeda very much moved away from and was instead wholeheartedly adopted by the Islamic State. Yeah, their whole concept of the elimination of the grey zone where they make it impossible for the Muslim community worldwide to stand by and not participate in the conflict, to either choose a side, to choose being with them on the path of kind of righteousness or, or being with the, the enemy and becoming a, a legitimate target. The other thing I think is really interesting in terms of covering kind of the accuracy of the film is not depicting all of the characters as kind of lone actors. You know, they operate you know, together as a cell. But what is also really important for Omar, one of the main characters, is the role that his family plays in supporting him on his course. You know, not only are they fully aware of what he's planning, they're not dissuading him from that, but they instead kind of provide a lot of support um, and encouragement. Yeah, I also found it mad how um, involved the son is and how open they are with him. And um, he kind of says, you'll be in heaven before your head hits the ceiling, um, which is such a serious point, but kind of delivered in such a light-hearted way. It's one of those kind of killer lines that makes you laugh and then pause with the, yeah, with the, the seriousness and the poignancy of it. You know, there are scenes where they're sitting around and, you know, the son is... Well, the whole family is watching the, the martyrdom videos that they've kind of produced for themselves and commenting on them. And the son kind of even acting a little bit as the, as the moral conscience uh, driving Omar forward when they're doing the bedtime story and converting uh, uh, the Lion King into a, into a jihadist narrative. It is a very dark film in terms of the themes, but I think the way that it handles that is very impressive in terms of not just the, yeah, the seriousness of the film, but the the poignancy of that as well. Um, I found the tenderness of the goodbye between Omar and his wife, Sophia, um, really interesting in terms of essentially how happy she is and how and how proud she is about what he's doing. And you know, that links into what we were talking about before in terms of the support of the family. Because she's essentially seeing her husband off to death and we'll, you know, we'll never, we'll never see him again. But she looks touched and and happy in the you know and that she understands um or can can empathize with what it is that he's doing and, and why yeah it's that kind of sense of yeah like you said pride in the, the the fulfillment of his mission you know she's she supported him from the get-go she provided that emotional support when things were getting difficult that encouragement to keep going and she's now seeing that kind of coming to fruition. And yeah, as you said, the, you, you can see the, the happiness and the pride on the face, even, even in the midst of the, the improvised goodbye that they have and her, her cool in not just um, understanding, but then how she reacts to that underlines that she is uh, just as much a key part of the operation as, as Omar and the remaining cell members. 
yeah, I think another um, really poignant moment for me was the desperately sad ending for Wadge um, when I don't want to ruin anything, but he, he just has a total confusion and he wants to um, continue with their mission, um, but he doesn't know whether he's doing the wrong thing or the right thing and kind of the, the feeling of peer pressure. So they've got this far, they need to continue. Yeah, I mean, it kind of plays into and even and even kind of Barry uh, acknowledges that essentially um, Omar is oh, has manipulated his friend who relies on him desperately for for guidance and support. You know, one of his you know last words are you know, just tell me what to do, brother Omar. You know, tell me what to do. I'll do what you do, sort of thing. It's desperately sad, and it's but it speaks a lot, I think, to the wider issues around the. You know, radicalization and recruitment of individuals who are vulnerable, who are looking for guidance and being told what they need to do to, yeah, to achieve martyrdom. And then, you know, just after that, we have then the what I found was a, a particularly kind of poignant scene where um, Omar talks to his uh, his supervisor from his job, who he's kind of bumped into at the marathon, and yeah, one of his last words are, you know tell them that I was smiling you know the situation has gone really bad for him he was unable to stop uh, to keep Waj alive the mission is not gone how he was planning to at all and he ends up um, again spoiler alert I'm afraid um, yeah ends up you know, attacking the uh, you know a, a chemist which is you know the explicit thing that he said he didn't want to do but he still kind of forces himself to smile to tells his you know his supervisor you know tell them i was smiling playing into that militant islamist trope that you know martyrs you know smile in death so aware right up to the end that even though things have been a failure still trying to make sure that he's kind of covering off on the bases so that when it does get reported he still is able to provide somewhat of an example for other militants one of the kind of the last um, points in terms of yeah the serious element of the film that I want to discuss is yeah you know, comes kind of right at the end in the credits where Omar's yeah very pious but very non-violent brother having been arrested earlier in the film is being interrogated at uh, an air force base in the US but uh, unfortunately for him is in a is in a shipping container um, that has been declared legally a uh, sovereign Egyptian territory and is therefore able to kind of be threatened with uh, you know with horrible torture uh, that is of course illegal in the UK but entirely permissible in Egypt. I think this obviously uh, exaggerated satire spoke a lot to the uh, draconian nature, a lot of the um, of the counterterrorism response to 9/11 and the you know, the broader war on terror across the across the 2000s. I thought um, again using humour to satirise what is a, you know, a very serious point about human rights and the use of torture. So that satirical humour is a broad theme that permeates throughout the film. I mean, for such a dark film in terms of its themes and the content that it deals with, it's balanced with a huge amount of, of humour and levity. A lot of the humour is perhaps very uh, very British in its nature. A lot of the references maybe would go over the head of, a, of, of an international audience, but um, it is one of those films that is eminently quotable and filled with a huge amount of kind of laugh out loud and memorable moments and we just want to flag up a couple of our kind of favorite moments um or kind of iconic scenes from the uh, from the film i think one of one of my favorites to start with is when they're in the van and they're traveling down to london and they're starting off listening to the to the nasheed you know following kind of you know tight religious practice and everyone looks you know very you know, enthusiastic they know this is you know the right thing to be doing but no one's really kind of feeling the energy of it and it cuts into them yeah you know, later on listening to top loader and all absolutely um <laughs> absolutely loving it and um and singing along and it's such um it's such a kind of hilarious change in the in the vibe of the film and says so much about who the guys actually are and and who they want to be I agree, I love that bit. I also love it when um, they're filling up the van with all their equipment and two of them walk out and they're shaking their heads and they look like <laughs> yes. absolute idiots. And one of them's like, what are you doing? Why, why are you doing that? And they, and they say to avoid detection, they want to avoid surveillance. Yeah, the um, surveillance. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and pretty um, yeah, half-hearted attempts. It's not going to help them very much. <laughs> 
Yeah, I like the bit where they were basically moving essentially all of their explosives from one building to the other. And, you know, they're walking (laughs) very, very carefully with all of the explosives in these bags. And at some point they leave a bag behind and a person that they'd run into just goes, oh, mate, you like you, you left your bag and just throws it. And the moment of, you know, the, the sheer panic of all of them, you know, knowing that they can't disclose that there's explosives in this bag, but essentially them running to catch it and then continuing to essentially wobble across the street. Um, I found that to be just absolutely hilarious. Yeah, and, and, and the squat jogs yeah. as well. Um, I mean, that's another thing that the, the film does. Um, I guess one of the few areas where it, it exaggerates a little bit because oh, when they're making the explosives, you know, using bleach here from that, you can in further they're making TATP explosives which are theoretically easy to produce but actually incredibly uh, incredibly volatile you'd wonder how capable uh, these individuals would actually be of producing such large quantities but it's certainly in terms of the volatility of those explosives that's pretty accurately represented not just in the uh, the sheer panic and terror when they uh, when the guy throws the bag to them, but then also when um, poor brother Fessel is running through the field and conducts his deadly attack on the on the food infrastructure of the UK. In terms of some of the other kind of really, uh, I guess, niche references in the humour, one of the things I love is when Omar you know, bumps into his uh, his supervisor at the marathon and you know, secretly confides that he's uh, you know, he's M up from MI5 and that uh, you know, the ongoing situation is is a result of a collaboration between Fathers for Justice uh, and the Real IRA, which is um, a very mid 2000s uh, British security reference, but one that I thought was hilarious. Any other key key moments that people want to highlight or things that they found particularly memorable? Yeah, I guess it also shows um, kind of following on from the explosives and buying bleach. Um, so the fact that they managed to purchase 30 bottle or more bottles yeah. of bleach and, and he kind of goes in, he says he uses these disguises and he pretends to be a woman and he uses his hand to hide his beard, which obviously is going to be very convincing. Um, but it kind of shows that... Um, I mean, he's managed to purchase all the all this amount of um, this large amount of bleach with his awful disguises. So another part, another one of the parts that I found quite funny is when um, Omar and Raj travel to Pakistan um, to go to a training camp, and I think this maybe points to how serious or how committed um, Raj is to his cause. He essentially tries to take a selfie of himself um, with you know with his weapons and thinking that maybe he was going to show off to somebody else, but he's actually running the risk of disclosing the location of the training camp by using his cell phone. Um, so there's this moment when one of the leaders of the training camp runs in and, you know, smashes his phone, um, you know, pointing to him how, how stupid that that was. Yeah, it's one of the kind of the, the, the moments that kind of stands out, that disparity between them, their training or, or lack thereof, um, and then their arrival in the camp and the realities the realities of it, and I think what that actually does quite well is satirises you know, actually kind of recorded activity of, of British Muslims when they travel to places like Pakistan's tribal areas for training where, um, you know, there are a few notable instances where uh, the, the, the British guys were too lazy to train. They were completely useless. You know, they sat around just watching, um, you know, jihadist videos all day and were eventually kind of sent home having learned nothing, which is pretty ably kind of mirrored in the film. Yeah, one of the, the last things, I think, it's one of those um, one of those killer lines from the film, kind of right towards the end, when they're kind of strapping on their, their explosives and their costumes for the marathon, when yeah, the police officer comes up and you know, he looks at their, their costumes and he says, yeah, you're going to die in that gear, lads. To which Omar's response is, it's all for a good cause, which again is one of those very funny but poignant moments that kind of underscore the film and I think encapsulates very neatly what the yeah what the vibe of the film is and on that note I think we're going to wrap up the podcast there thank you to everyone for listening um, thank you to my colleagues from JTIC for joining me and as I said earlier just to reiterate for more information on what JTIC does to look at the global attack index infographic as I said visit janes.com forward slash terrorism